So hello and welcome to the first panel discussion with Hightech Connect in 2023. Today we want to discuss the state of Hightech job creation in Europe compared with Silicon Valley and Israel. We are asking, will Europe create enough Hightech jobs to ensure a prosperous future? I have invited three former colleagues and friends uh, um, uh, with, uh, who can, with their extensive international work experience uh, in high tech, discuss this topic extremely well. From Qatar, Marcel Twitchy, who looks back to a great career in sales, data networking, startups, and established companies too, such as Cisco and EMEA, and is also on the board of the European Angel um, Association. Hello, Marcel. Thanks for being here. Hi, Ralph. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Sure. Uh, how does Qatar look like after the Soccer World Cup these days? Absolutely amazing uh, because um, they've already asked my question, uh, what do I think about the whole Qatar uh, uh, fintech, uh, sports tech, that's the two verticals that are pushed here and the World Cup has a fantastic yeah. impact, especially on tourism. The uh, first time I've seen uh, actually tourists from Germany, a big, big, big um, uh, cruise ships are coming in into Doha as we speak. Okay, cool. Yeah, thanks again for being here. Then we have Victor Bergensoli, CEO of Edsport Tech, ca calling in from Miami in Florida. Hi, Victor. Thanks for joining again. Good morning for me. Hi, everybody. Hello. So, how's the temperature today in Miami? Wearing a swim pants below? <laughs> uh, yesterday was twenty-seven degrees. I played tennis in the afternoon. It was a little bit hot, but um, I'm flying now to Atlanta, and it's much cooler. I see. Okay. And last but not least, Vincent Pieri, co-founder of NextThink, the Swiss unicorn in digital employee experience management software. And he's also involved as an advisor and coach with many startups. Uh, hi, Vincent. Thank you, too, for your time. Hi, Ralph. Thanks for having me. Sure, sure. Um, uh, are we a bit jealous about Marcel and Victor, the two uh, of us being in cold Switzerland? Or are you getting ready for a ski tour this weekend again soon in the Swiss Alps? Yes, uh, it's good condition now, so I'm enjoying uh, a lot of uh, ski mountaineering at the moment. Right, yeah. Cool. Uh, so let me please jump into this topic with a bit of a provocative, uh, probably um, about five minutes short, uh, maybe one or two minutes longer. Slight presentation intro to give some motivation for the discussion, I hope. And after this, I would like immediately to hear all of your thoughts, um, um, what I presented in a few sentences, so, so we get into it full steam. So, all right. So... Um, is going wrong is my question to you guys and maybe Marcel you want to want to start uh, taking this on uh, is uh, was this too provocative um, I'm, I'm too negative with uh, this intro how do you see this uh, but maybe only just briefly um, and then we go into the questions uh, thanks um, actually um, within your statement um, I can see all the comments but one thing that you noted that there was a lot of European innovation happening anyway. I think the only caveat is that particular innovation is not celebrated the best way as they do in, in Silicon Valley. And that's why you have a lots and lots of brain. I call it the brain drain. You'd be amazed how much Cambridge, how much Oxford University went to the West Coast and they were basically embraced by the whole friendly VC slash risk taking. I think the European culture is all about taking risks. To be frank with you, I sit on IBAN board. Uh, we are the lobby to the European uh, uh, grants. Six to seven billion of EU grants is funneled towards the tech, uh, the tech side, the startup ecosystem, incubators, accelerators. Mm. That's a fact. However, I think the culture, the European culture, we talk about USA, one language, English, ease of doing business, East Coast, West Coast. And it goes on and on and on. So I think somebody need to fix what I call the seamless, easy to do business. That's my first point. Second point is, is really those innovators need to be encouraged to stay here in Europe and have that VC backing all the way to scale ups, all the way to round A, round B. So mm -hmm. that's what I think the, the your comments on making uh, 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 with your shocking title that we're not creating enough jobs. I think, first of all, the culture is all about SMEs. I look at France, French tech, I know very well, I was part of it. Um, SMEs, SMEs, SMEs. I mean, it's just a small, medium mm. enterprises. Okay. Apart uh, from, apart so, from so, so. Let, me finish, let me finish. Apart from, you're not going to take this away from Europe, big companies 
SMCF, TGV, nuclear power, EDF. So you have to think about those big state-owned type businesses. Innovation, Airbus, innovation is happening there. Okay. Unfortunately, to your point, startups, ecosystem need to basically be encouraged. So now we need to hand over to Victor. So thanks, Marcel. Go ahead. Uh, so just, Go just, ahead. Uh, just, a short, just, just a short, short uh, uh, comment that it was the idea. Anyway, Victor, what's your, Marcel, what's your take? Ma Ma Marcel said it uh, all. Um, you know, <clears throat> what is? I just saw um, a, a wonderful documentary called The Billion Dollar Code, which is the, the story of TerraVision and Google Earth. It's on Netflix. It's in German. It's very well done. And it shows the Deutsche Telekom back then being so scared at innovation. And finally, you know, Google took it over and made Google Earth, which is a major success. Now, risk, risk is the, the culture point that we have. In, you mentioned Israel. Israel is a risk-taking culture. You know, they like to take risk. They don't mind if you make a failure, if you fail. And in the US, when I hire people, if they fail two, three times, I'm going to hire them more than if somebody has never done anything, which is not the case in Europe. Failure is not seen as something good. And what I want to add as well, very quickly, we say the US, and yes, it's a big market, it's one language, but there are major differences in what city you establish your business. Silicon Valley, Boston, and New York are the leaders, and mainly Silicon Valley for technology. You know, if you're a fintech, you maybe go to New York and uh, clean tech or med tech is more in Boston, but it's extremely hard if you are not in one of these big cities. You know, we, I, I speak to entrepreneurs every day and they say it's hard to find the money if you don't have a presence in San Francisco, uh, which is very interesting as well. Mm. Thank you. Vincent, your take, quick take. <laughs> sure. So I, I can only share my own experience. I'm not a macroeconomist or whatever, but so we co-founded a, a tech startup in Switzerland and scale it up internationally to a unicorn status or a, now about a two, 200 million AR company. Um, yes, it's harder, to, I think, to do it from here for all the reasons that were mentioned. Uh, I would say two differences from what I've learned, you know, from, from other entrepreneurs doing it elsewhere where numbers are bigger in investment and anything else. It's A, when we scaled, it was very hard to found people who did it already because, because the ecosystem is small and hasn't already been you know, done very, very you know, often and again and again. If you need a highly experienced, I don't know, product manager or CFO knowing about uh, IPO or whatever, you don't have it next door, right? If you're in Lausanne or Zurich or whatever. Uh, and that's 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 that makes it difficult because if you are in a, in a, in the U.S., you know there are many people who have done it already and can contribute very quickly. Uh, that was one thing, and and I guess we that's why the problem when companies leave, you know, as soon as they get bigger because they only found funding somewhere else or people, and then you know we will never have that critical mass to create great teams. And the second is. The state or the governments, the the you know, and everything else. Here they are very good at bootstrapping stuff, uh, whether in the labs at university or incubators or or you know um, you know uh, innovation parks and things like that. But they are not very good at becoming you know uh, the clients of those startups. If you look at you know major big companies now. Google or, or others, if you look at their stories, they get encouraged by the government, but they also got the opportunity to be deployed or used, you know, if it was making sense by those supporting government. For us, we got money to create the, you know, the company to do the first, you know, bootstrapping. And then when you go back to the state of wherever you're based, who actually gave you a 100K loan to say, don't your department, we were in IT technology, want to see what we do with the money you, we got from our taxes? <laughs> and they would say, well, you know, and then it's very, very hard. And, and, and it was the hardest to sell was actually to the ones who supported us the most, which is, 
we should do something different. Right. Uh, you know, if in, in the US, you see people having, you know, presence in the government, in the military, or and so on. Same with Israel, I, I suppose, from what I know. Uh, they all, not only get the funding to invent and bootstrap, they get the opportunity to, to, to be the first, um, you know, uh, to enter the market through those agency <clears throat> and government. Right, right. Okay, let's uh, let's keep this thought. Uh, I will come back to this uh, later because it's something I observed as well. But let's first uh, talk about Silicon Valley, since this is, of course, still uh, yeah, the uh, uh, epicenter of uh, high tech. Uh, and even if the last quarter um, was bad, uh, but I'm sure um, that will come back uh, big time. Uh, the VCs, they have uh, lots and lots of firepower money. So um, so Marcel, um, what's your take on it uh, briefly? Um, looking at Silicon Valley, um, is this uh, are they still uh, to be uh, looked at and um, some guys try to copy them? Um, or is this actually overrated these days and uh, it's uh, maybe an old model uh, and uh, we should uh, we should not even uh, bother about them. Um, so Marcel, what's your take on, on, on Silicon they, Valley now? So? They're still relevant uh, from where I sit. I've worked uh, for the last 30 years for a Series A, Series B, West Coast based companies, bringing them into EMEA. And most of them were successful IPO. And um, one of them got acquired by Cisco. The last one I did, Airspace, back in 2005. So I think Silicon is still, Silicon Valley is still relevant. But the biggest challenge I have here sitting on the IBAN board is to convince all the ecosystem we're behind the African Business Engine Network for African countries. I am in the GCC. I'm talking to Saudi, I'm talking to Egypt. A, a small thriving community of ecosystem and they're all making the same mistake they're all saying we want to see how what worked in silicon valley and i'm saying shame on them because you have your own local dna that can actually work it out i'll give you an example morocco i advise them to look at um, um, uh, agri-tech 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 because they have a play there from a north african perspective they have the largest world solar farm. I don't know if you know that. The EU actually paid for that. But they're not, like CERN in Switzerland and France, they're not leveraging that particular installation to have open innovation and make business out of it. So coming back to Silicon Valley, I think they're still relevant. But one thing that we never, never compete against them is the flow of money. VC, they take risks. They still, I can see more and more, more and more, companies coming out there in space tech, in agri-tech, in, uh, in especially AI. AI, I think China definitely paid the crap out of Europe for a lot of reasons. And one of the things I liked about your statements earlier on was regulation, 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 regulation. So somebody in EU need to listen compared to Silicon Valley to make it easy to do business with and stop going after all those excessive regulation. So Silicon Valley for me, they're still creative. I'll give you an example. The last startup I did, um, Stone Venture, which you know very well, Ralph, they actually gave the money to some engineers taking the risk with $2 million and say, go and find out why Wi-Fi in the enterprise is not working. The next thing you knew, they spin it out into an external startup and that startup was successful from zero to 16 million and Cisco paid north of a billion plus uh, to acquire that company. So that's how VC in the US is done. Risk, risk taking, risk taking, and they're in all, all spaces or verticals uh, uh, that we can talk about. So Silicon Valley for me, yes, is still thriving, but please, from a European perspective, do not copy everything that is uh, Silicon Valley. We have our own DNA, look at all the research park, parks, what is specific, especially in the emerging technologies. Um, Cybersecurity as an example, Israel was a good example on basically taking the lead there. And one caveat as well, I talk about Israel as well, is how they had this clever idea 25 years ago to have R&D research in Israel mm. and do a soft landing in the US. Yeah, we'll be coming to Israel in a minute. Uh, Victor, what is uh, your take on Silicon Valley? Um, you are not in Silicon Valley. You are exactly the opposite side of the US in Florida. <laughs> Is uh, the beach better there, or why are you guys there? Uh, but uh, yeah. it's a joke. Um, so what's your take on Silicon Valley? Still relevant? Should we copy them? And what's what? What can we learn from them, if anything? Yeah. I, I think the main point is what Marcel said about risk taking, but they are taking risk with other people's money as well. 
So when, when you look at FTX debacle, you know, where they gave hundreds of billions of dollars to a company with no CFO and no board, that would never happen anywhere else, uh, I think. And then when you look at who invested the money, you have the Ontario Teachers Fund. These are not from Silicon Valley. So what is interesting is a lot of people who are risk adverse still put a lot of money in Silicon Valley to say, just go ahead, you take risk and it seems that you know what you are doing. Um, and, and, and that's what we need to change is the fact that you, we have to accept that failure is an option, that it's okay to lose money. You know, one out of 10, that's the rule. You don't find a unicorn if you're just trying to find one unicorn and hoping that's the one. And that's what we need to do. And in Europe, as compared to Silicon Valley, there are too many languages, too many borders, too many regulations, too many fights. Uh, already in Switzerland, look at Zurich, Geneva, Lausanne, everybody's fighting. Instead of saying, you know, it's a small country, I can drive two and a half hours and go from, one, from Zurich to Lausanne, for instance, and for me, it's the same region. I mean, if I have to travel two hours, it's, it's Miami South to Miami North for me, and that has to change as well. So DNA in, in, in terms of risk-taking and accept, accepting failure, that's what needs to happen for me. And then, right. and then you take what Silicon Valley is doing well. Right. So Vincent, what's your take on Silicon Valley? You have actually lived and worked there, if I'm not mistaken, before you started, uh, or is this a wrong <laughs> no, recollection? No, I work for Cisco, but uh, I had nothing to do with ah, okay, okay. So, neither founding the company or 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 doing but you have you have been there a few times but i've been there many times yes because mm -hmm. i worked as a, a, a as a representative for one of the business units here in in europe so i was in touch yeah, and often there but uh mm -hmm. but i have no idea what it is what it is to build a business there i've never started one from there um what what i however i, I have one thing i might want to share on that which is you know if i look at my own experience Having done a you know a pretty successful journey of, of, of a startup, I, I think one thing we we always we we didn't try to do is to copy anyone or to copy anything you know somewhere else uh, just by you know by the fact that something has worked somewhere else because if you look at DNA which I agree with completely but if your DNA is that you know uh, you are not uh, ready to travel two hours a day to go for work that's what it is and you have to do things with what you've got right and you have to build a model that works for who you are and how you think and how you 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 know you you engage in projects in the risk you take i think there are a lot of people taking a lot of risk here as well um so it's it, the, the problem is is actually to map a model on something that is not fit for it and i think we have to create our own model uh, that will work with the ingredients we have, right? Um, and not trying to do mayonnaise if you don't have the ingredients, you maybe do <laughs> butter, right? And, and that's also very well sellable and can taste great. And maybe we have different tastes when we say it's successful or it's, it, it, you know, what, what does it mean, right? And I think what we should also do now is there are too many, including me, uh, old people, around this table here to talk about this. We need to take and listen to how young generation uh, behaves, wants what their purpose are, et cetera, et cetera, because they will define the next model and be the actor of it. And we shouldn't be uh, too much uh, basically uh, thinking too, too far because we're not gonna be there anyway to do it. <laughs> All right, good, thanks, yeah. So. Um... But guys, I like to shake you up a little bit. Uh, I'm not sure if you have really <laughs> followed my presentation. We are not talking like double or triple better. You know, that would be maybe something. You know, they're still uh, ambitious uh, to go after. We are talking hundred x. If I look at, it's actually hundred fifty x. If I compare, let's say Switzerland, which is number three in uh, Europe, um, um, with uh, all of California, Southern California, and the LA area, where it's actually also venture capital investment uh, going on quite well. Um, then we have 150x, right? If you're in a company and you have a competitor or you try to compare yourself with someone who is 150 times, uh, I don't know, more invested and uh, bigger than you, um, you, you cannot really compete. So so, so, it looks, so it looks like these jokes uh, maybe are justified. I mean, we, maybe you're talking a little bit too down. We have a, we have a 150x issue here. Um, Marcel, are you challenged by this? <laughs> 
I, I am challenged by this um, uh, uh, one, one, one a bit of data for you. I think it'd be great for you to go back to your uh, YouTube channel and have this um, documentary called um, uh, Something Ventured, Something Ventured. That's the title of it. And it tells you about the whole Fairchild history of Silicon Valley and how Intel was born thereafter. And what's consistent with that, including uh, uh, Don Valentine, who uh, invested in Cisco. We were talking about Cisco earlier on. Uh, both Vincent and I worked for Cisco. And they talk about the further, the former CEO at Cisco, a lady uh, with her husband and how they were ousted uh, by the VC themselves. Um, so when you look at that documentary, it's actually an amazing, amazing journey to understand about your 150X. It's the appetite, is the appetite of the backing up uh, a particular project. I mean, they were behind starting the beginning of a start of stem cells research. They were behind the biotech companies. They were behind the space. And we're talking about big numbers. So again, I'm gonna go back and insist why we're talking about 150X. 300 million Americans, East Coast to West Coast in general, I always uh, compare uh, Apple for Apple. Same type of literally- This, this was per capita. No, 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 I'm talking about- 50 X is per capita, that's important. Yeah, but I'm not me, comparing me, apples uh, with- uh, let, me, let, me, let me come to that. With, with the forest. So let me come back to that. 300 million, 300 million more or less. And there's one thing that's right streak you in the head. It's how culture is different. How languages are different. My friend Victor was mentioning just the mentality of Zurich and Lugano and, and Lausanne, Genève. I invested in a Swiss company based in Genève. And it's interesting that uh, only the canton that are French speaking were competing to do a matching with the uh, Sofia Business Angels, as an example, for a small, tiny country of Switzerland. Um, but in the US, like I said, one culture, one language, one way of doing business. And again, look at the background of your slide, Ralph, the universities, the background, the MIT background, et cetera. You have a trend there. In Europe, we're fragmented by default. We don't have a unified voice. A good example from a geopolitic, we've been fighting around with the Ukrainian war. Look, Germany, just out of the blue, just say, I'm sending some tanks. Next thing you knew, France is thinking about it. So until we actually talk in a unified way, maybe invent a new language, I guess, that will unify all the European <laughs> countries. But again, you cannot change a mentality. I'll give you an example. A bank in France, would give you millions and millions, talking about 150X. If you are a young farmer to buy a property to actually farm with high-tech, satellite, agri-tech, uh, AI, you name it, they will give you the millions. But if you are an entrepreneur in high-tech and you failed only once, your name is there as being shamed and nobody will back you up. So failure is not celebrated in this part of the world. So I'm just again repeating myself in a couple of uh, denominators until we change those two or three knobs going forward, you're not gonna see the 150 times X, period. And yet Europe is giving 9 billion worth of grants to startups. I can speak to a French friend of mine. He got 40 million of grants from, from Europe. And when he went scale up, and wanted to do the sales and expand worldwide, all the doors of VC money stopped. Guess what he did? He's in Silicon Valley right now. And his company is 3.7 billion valuation. He's in data storage, by the way. So that is where I think the pain point is. And go back to the regulators. Maybe they're the ones that need to be convinced, or maybe we should uh, stop paying uh, tax money and elect those people. <laughs> <laughs> to go private all the way and liberate the economy, maybe. So 150, 150 times, I agree with you, but it doesn't help me when I'm not going back to basics and resolving those two or three uh, topics that we're all in agreement uh, during this discussion. All right. Big, yeah. Okay. Big, Victor, are you challenged by this 150x? Um, uh, you know, um, looks like uh, they're playing Champions League and I don't know where we, we play uh, in the... Swedish Oberland League <laughs> right now. I mean, it, it, that, that's what you just said. You know, every country in Europe has its differences. 
uh, the scale up, I remember a good friend of mine, Martin Fetterly, who is the president of EPFL, uh, we co-founded Dartfish together. And he, he gave a good speech like 10, 15 years ago about the value of death that is you know, Europe. You have Silicon Valley and you, you, you raise money. We are great at innovation. I mean, Switzerland and Europe is great at innovation. You bring your startup to a certain level and then what do you have to do to scale up? You have to go to a place where they're like, okay, we have the, the money you know, to fund your expansion. And, and that's all you, you have a different experience and, uh, and it's amazing what you did. But most of these companies, that's what they are looking at is like, okay, now it's, I have to move, I have to move somewhere else where they can really help me expand. And that's what has to change. Uh, if that doesn't change, then we can have all the DNA we want, all the innovation we want, um, you know, risk, risk taking. Uh, that's that's the main one. When you create a risky business, people have to have the money to say, okay, you need, you know, 100 million, 200 million, here it is, and we are ready to take the risk, which is very rare in Europe at this stage. All right, yeah, thanks. Vincent, uh, are you challenged by this 150x? Uh, I, I take another example. Um, I think if this would be the other way around, I claim in the US, they would say this is a Sputnik thing and we need to, we need to get the, the S together here um, and we need to really fundamentally do something and they would crank out the billions and billions to get this rolling. I claim, um, whereas we're sitting here and say we are actually cool. I don't know. I, well, I, <laughs> so, you know, so, I don't uh, personally. I don't feel challenged by things like that because okay. they're beyond my control. But, but uh, what I think, the way I look at it, uh, I was listening to what was said. Which, you know, ideally you could always, you know, wish that a, uh, you know, uh, you know, hundred years of history overnight change everything, <laughs> but they, it won't. So you, it's much better to play with the cards you have. So. Personally, I love the diversity and the differences uh, of Europe, the different languages, the different culture, uh, and, and you can actually take it as an opportunity, you know, to bring different people together and, and if you make it work. And I think we did that because just in Lausanne, we had about 20 different nationalities in, in, in our office where we created an atmosphere where everybody wanted to contribute with what they had to bring in. Of course, it's more complicated than in the US, but in the US, it's boring because everybody speaks the same thing, thinks the same way, I've been to the same school, read the same books. I mean, you know, so if, I, if you take what is what we are very good at and you leverage what we are good at, which is everything but what they are good at, by the way, you suddenly realize, you know what, I prefer to hire people from you know, different places in Europe or strange countries wherever you want than, than uh, people from US. Because, you know, they are great when everything is like what they are used to, right? But when they are in a diverse environment, which is, you know, you, you drive one hour and everything is different, you know, everybody's lost. So, so we have to play with that and not trying to, you know, it's a little bit like uh, if you wish the weather was different today, you know, that's a pointless thing to change, right? If you, if you say, you know, it's, this region is too hot or too humid, you know, I cannot grow whatever. Well, that's the way it is. You have to play with what it is there. And there are, there are places to do certain things and places to do other things good. And, and, and we, have to, we have to look at it like that, in my opinion, because mm -hmm. we won't change that. Right. Well, then uh, let me pick up one thing that you uh, said earlier, uh, Vincent, that uh, I fully share because I had the exact same experience working for startups here in Europe. Um, the government, they might give, uh, you know, General, general grants or something, but when you want to offer your products as a startup to them, then uh, we buy from the US already, right? So I mean, from all the IT companies. And it, by the way, I want to expand this. My experience is clearly the big companies in Europe who is implementing an unproven startup, even if the technology is more or less already good and uh, they have some you know, leverage or so into their organization, into operations, I have not found one. Whereas in the US, I was living a long time in the US, I could sell my stuff to the major telcos there. They bought it in big volumes and they tried to, and they, of course they had, there were problems, it's clear, right? So some companies went out of business even and had a bigger problem, but they did that 
they took that risk as well to be a potentially then you know take advantage of it um and uh, do we need to force the government to not only give out uh, you know uh, funding uh, or so but also invest into these startups and by the way in some way i'm not I, i'm not sure how you can do it but maybe you can tax incentivize uh, big companies to use uh, startup technology uh give them some kickback or something and force them that way to overcome this uh cultural um, um, uh, problem here because it seems to be a cultural problem. They they don't take the risk either. And of course, that makes it growing for a young startup uh, nearly impossible. You know, I mean, that's my experience. Uh, Marcel, uh, you want to take the, the lead on that one? Yeah, um, interesting uh, questions um, uh, and consultation, my friend, Ralph. Um, for 30 years, I was bringing West Coast high tech to Europe. And what's interesting is there were startups. But somehow the Europeans, to your earlier point, they love high tech from the US for some strange reason. And if you have to compare Apple for Apple, they would always go for this Series A proven in the US and they would give me the benefit of the doubt. I inserted every single thing, be it uh, ascent communication into France Telecom, Deutsche Telecom, Telefonica, Telia, you name it. Same thing with airspace. So what, what you're saying is startup in general, if they have the confidence and the right finance backup with the right team, they can do wonder on a world basis. Something I found different between European startups, and I'm sure Vincent can comment later on, product management. Product management, it's an amazing, amazing differentiation between a US startup and the European. I, I never saw in the high tech world, I'm sure it's changing now for sure, because there's a new wave, a new wave of startup and new wave of generation, younger generation, where they've been to some US schools, et cetera, and they understand what product management is all about. But every time I inserted the new technology here in Europe, the product management really made a difference. That's one of it. Second thing is, I think is the ease to do business with. The Americans, I love the way they do business. Keep it simple, you know, from a price structure, from a go-to market strategy, and even from a marketing funds to push a certain technology. Um, so in listening to you, to be frank with you, I think the European startups need to be helped. If we have to ask a regulator to regulate, is to say, shame on you. I gave you 400K from European taxpayer money as a grant to do your POC or your MVP, doesn't matter what it is. Well, guess what? In return, you have a priority against a Chinese government, a Chinese product, or an American product, or Canadian product. Maybe that can fuel the appetite for all this, uh, especially corporates. You know, we have uh, Europe is really known for huge, huge corporate opportunities, uh, banking, uh, insurance companies, railway, infrastructure, you name it. I think if we actually put a new rule by saying, I'm giving you 400K, give me a proof of concept. And by the way, if you validate certain things, we have a list of corporates that will actually buy or help you uh, insert your first a trial. I call it uh, like a, a try and buy program per se. So maybe that would work. Maybe that okay. would work. Victor, what's your take on this? Uh, should we force the government yeah. to also use startup technology uh, and the corporations give them some tax, uh, some tax uh, kickback or something to so they finally use uh, European uh, startup tech? Uh, not, uh, you know, uh, yeah. I, I don't like to hear the word forced. You know, if you're forced to use something, it's never a good thing. Uh, what I mean, in, to... encourage uh, taxes, yeah, yeah, encouraging. Yeah. I mean, and, and I think that's what Israel does extremely well. You know, right? The, the government is really funding a lot of companies and they use the technology right away because they've established a strong, you know, relationship with these entrepreneurs. And maybe they even come out of some of the government agencies, especially the military. But, you know, I really like what Marcel said about U.S. companies be extremely good at product management. I mean, the, the U.S. people, and I'm... I'm I'm an American now as well as much as a Swiss, but are the best marketers in the world. And you know, when you hire someone in in the uh, in the U.S., the first time I came here, I received all these resumes. I'm like, wow, I'm only attracting the best of the best. It's just amazing. That's the that's the way they you know they they present themselves, and they're extremely good at not selling the technology, but you know selling why 
you should buy the technology. And I think a maybe too many Europeans are too shy. You know, they develop a technology, they think it's a product and Americans are going to push the product even before sometimes they have the technology. And that's maybe why some European companies are going to buy American first, thinking that it's much more advanced than the European counterpart. So maybe we need to take some of this. And I agree, Vincent, we cannot change the DNA of people. We cannot really change who they are, but we can, help Europeans to be better at product management, looking at the, the technology they have and making it a product. You know, I call that the Apple effect. I mean, Steve Jobs was the best at doing that. All right. Vincent, uh, what do you think about my idea? <laughs> I, I think governments should not be forced. They should be proud of using local technology and mm -hmm. partnering with local entrepreneurs and people. It, it, it's because this is what happened, right? Uh, I think, you know, for good or bad, you know, the US, they they only consider what is American, you know, every every time they look at something. If they, if you watch, I don't know, a, a downhill ski in Kitzbühel, you know, they will spend all the, the time, uh, you know, broadcasting the US um, skiers, okay. although they are not very good, but they will, but in Kidsville, there are no women down men. But that's what I mean. Well, but when I'm not, I didn't say they, they, they are, not, but even when they are not first, when you watch something on TV in the US, it, it looks like they won the race. The way <laughs> you look at it, right? Yeah. So, Amazing. <laughs> for, for good or bad, right? What I mean by that is they are proud about what is coming from their uh, nationality right so and it's and it's the same right if you are a government employee you will be proud to buy from whatever technology that has been developed grown what locally which is not necessarily the case here but i guess it's cultural but it's also a question of awareness i guess because they just don't know right sometimes you know when i was i had the opportunity to speak with whatever, CIO or CTO or potential buyer of our technology, they just didn't know all this was going on. The reason is a little bit linked to, and I think this will change, but those people who are now in charge of those decisions, they are maybe 50, 60 years old or whatever, they were from a generation where there was nothing, right, uh, to be purchased locally. So they are friends with this guy in IBM, this guy at Microsoft, whatever, at Cisco, and they've lived through that, and and not with with them right uh so and i think the reflex is well i look west across the atlantic to to search for what's happening uh, and the second point about the product management th when you said it that for me it's i always give this example because this was a the most important uh let's say differentiator we could make to, to you know boost our growth and so on was was from that and was the most difficult um team to to hire and build uh simply because if you hire a guy who was at let's say Cisco to give an example he tells you I'm a product manager based in Paris or Rome or or London they are actually not product manager right because they are representing a bit which is what I did right a business unit in Europe but you're not building a product you're not building a market and this is something you can only learn when you do it um you know from 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 the ground up and there are not so many people like that available now right. more and more but i think all this will evolve right that takes yeah. time it takes a couple of generation of entrepreneur failure success to build yeah. this critical mass right right and by the yeah. way from so, anecdotes ralph was an excellent excellent product manager in his career uh, yeah, I just wanted to say that, uh, not, not the, ex the excellent part, but I, I was product manager in Silicon Valley 20 years ago. And uh, when I when I call back to my friends who are working at, uh, you know, the usual uh, Siemens, whatnot, uh, they ask me, what are you doing as a product manager for a data networking company? And they, then they said, what the heck are you doing? Marketing, what is product management? I said, well, you don't, you guys don't have that or what? So it came years later, it only came um, as a job. And of course, at the beginning, maybe differently, I was attached, uh, I, I guess, to 
engineering yeah so that would be a complete different discussion here product management and what it is or not but uh, you're right uh, but uh, we have two options here now we have uh, 10 minutes and then have a hard stop because vincent has to leave uh, for board meeting and i and then i think we are done also um uh, so we have two options i want to do um, a quick um a polling here among you um, are we jumping at israel as a potential uh, uh um, as a topic um, and just, uh, a country that maybe we can learn something from or are we continuing on the path looking at the opportunities because the opportunity in europe is actually i just figured out looking at uh, the the worldwide web situation and the internet um in europe uh, or worldwide and i was actually quite surprised i always thought the us is by far the biggest it's not true europe is double or even triple bigger in number of uh, internet users in the US. Have you, have you know that? If you then add Africa, if you add Middle East, which is around the corner, we are three to four X bigger. So it's not true if you say you have to go to the US because there's a big, big market, it's a unified market. We have a three to four X bigger market right here, even if it's heterogeneous. So that would be the opportunity. What shall we do, guys? Uh, Israel or more along these lines? Uh, Vincent, what do you like to discuss? Uh, we have only nine minutes. <laughs> Well, uh, personally, I cannot talk too much about Israel. Uh, okay, uh, Victor, Israel or the other? You know, uh, we, I don't know much about Israel either. Okay, well, that's already then, uh, Marcel, um, I guess uh, then we don't even have to ask you and me. So we'll do the opportunity. Uh, Marcel, what opportunity do we really have and what do we need concretely do to, to kick the tires um, and to move uh, forward and close this 150x gap in, in uh, <laughs> smaller. So more ideas. So we have uh, eight minutes and a half. Um, uh, quickly, uh, because again, I'm speaking on behalf of IBAN and because I'm a, an investor, a business angel, I have like 17 startups where I put my money in. Um, I think is really, really uh, to uh, make a big initiative behind one particular vertical, which is agnostic to all the fantastic opportunities out there. That would be AI. I mean, we're really, really suffering. We're really behind. And one of the things that really shocked me, the regulation actually stopped, stopped the AI development because we are trying to be protected from a data perspective. And basically China at the other extreme, bless them. They just, they don't have permission and they just go ahead and next thing you knew, they are a leader. I mean, Talk about all those cameras out there. Look, London, London is the most camera enabled city in the world with New York. So think about if that protective of data of me and you ask the question to the citizen, am I good that I'm being protected? Question mark. And then the price, the heavy price to, to pay, you don't have a huge databases to tap in all those algorithms, all that machine learning to actually, because AI, if you want to have a, a successful model, any vertical, space tech, agri-tech, e-commerce, law, business, you name it, it's absolutely the next best fantastic opportunity, including biotech, including pharmaceutical. It goes on and on. Military, don't forget the military. Europe has a big play between the UK, France, and Germany, as an example, and Switzerland, for that matter, from a, an R&D perspective. Shame on us if we don't put an act together call it an act of AI growth and put the plan together because the investment is there. We have 4,400 business angel network across 25 European countries. We have the early stage programs. We have the entrepreneurs. I know many entrepreneurs in the space of AI, but let's make it as a big bet. You know, my friend Vincent uh, heard this word before. And when Cisco say a big bet, it has to be a 1 billion business in the next three years. So I think we have to help the EU to understand they have to make a big, big, big announcement for those grants to get to AI and then push for the VCs, the creation of mentality of VC to actually help the scale up, not go into the US and, and make it successful here. And that's what I think the opportunity is there. AI is agnostic to all cross verticals, many business opportunities out there in every sector. That can actually right. impact the, the success of Europe. Okay, Victor, what's your idea? Two or three minutes, I, then we have you know, Vincent. I, yeah. I I really like what you said, Marcel. Um, you know, AI for me would be the the, the next internet, right? Yeah. Everything we do uh, can be based on AI. I just had two discussions this week, Ralph, with two big companies who are very involved in AI, 
and for our sports tech, you know, business. And I'm I'm very impressed by the, the possibilities. And that's just for one vertical. So I, I like that. The, the challenge is if you have to involve the regulators, it may take a decade for them to do anything. So I think it's a, it's part of the investment community to say, you know, let's do it. And the market is worldwide. So, you know, regulation should be should come after. But if you have to first convince them, it might be a big problem. Thank you. Vincent. Um, well, well, I have a different opinion on that because uh, I, I, I don't think, I think there is op the opportunity is something, uh, but at which price you're ready to, you know, to which price you're ready to pay for, for an opportunity is something else. And, and, I, and I understand that some, some countries or some, some region, they, they are saying, okay, we, we don't give, uh, you know, this at any price. So that's why we have regulations. And, and I think that's good uh, because otherwise, uh, you know, we would all kill each other because murder is not regulated. So we, we need, and, and I remember 20 years ago uh, at, at Cisco, we had this discussion around, you know, uh, people were starting to say, yeah, but all this data, maybe with the internet, maybe there is privacy for citizens. Some people say, oh, fuck it, right? We just do what we want. And they did. Okay, you make money, but if that's the only purpose, then don't regulate anything. But if you want to make people, you know, or something more sustainable for the society, you probably need, uh, you know, to, to look at it a little bit more carefully. Uh, that's what I think, because otherwise... You know, it's 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 not just only a business. It can be, you know, it's information. It's about decisions you're going to make. You know, what, what are these algorithm? You know, really working. How do they develop their 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 answers? I think it's important also to to how we can trust that really because nowadays you cannot really much trust it. So so I think that's important as well. I know that's not a good idea probably to to multiply everything overnight. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, I think the way people will think at technology in the next 20, 30, 40 years will definitely change. And as I said, again, we are from a generation where we saw the almost the invention of the internet and things like that. Now it's a different thing. And uh, there will be probably also other priorities in the world that we have to, to actually look at uh, before simply deploying tech at, at, at the, the highest speed as possible. And, and I think sometimes the next opportunity, let's say for Europe, is maybe not just to copy paste or catch up or, or just pass a little bit faster what's already in progress and look at what's the next big thing uh, around, which is maybe, you know, for example, with food, there is an immense challenge that we're going to need to resolve for, for humanity, right? There will, won't be enough food for everybody in the way we are doing it. And the way we are doing it doesn't propose the right food with the right ingredients at enough people. And, you know, I, I, and it just creates a big mess at the moment. So that's one example. So I would look at other things than simply redoing, you know, yeah, with just different technology, something we did in the past. Because I guess if we bet on AI, for example, we will be beaten up by again Silicon Valley, US, or China, and so on, because that's not where that's not in our DNA to be good at doing this at scale. Probably other things we are better. Okay. Uh, thanks. Uh, th th yeah. 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 Thanks a lot, guys. Uh, we have a hard stop. We have twenty seconds for each or ten seconds for each of you. Final close. Uh, what can we do to create uh, prosperous jobs? Uh, many of them and well-paying jobs in the future. Ten seconds, Marcel, then Vincent, then. Or Victor I will, and Vincent. I will stick with AI and I will bet with AI and environment. All okay. right. Victor. Uh, focus, you know, find your niche, if we can call that a niche, and focus your market on it and the entrepreneurs and the network and the know-how and the universities. And just, you know, go full speed with it. And Vincent. I, I would create a, a way to organize the way we can set up the right teams for, for, for those startups to scale. Now it's very hard for people to find and know the right people uh, to build uh, you know, 
full 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 speed up uh, scale ups, uh, product managers, finance people, sales that know what it takes to to grow fast. It, it's very hard. It's one of the biggest challenge I see now. Thanks a lot, Marcel. Thanks a lot, Victoria. Thanks a lot, Vincent. It was a pleasure to talking to all and uh, pick your brain. Uh, you have a good uh, time and uh, we'll be in touch with all of you, I guess. Uh, and uh, happy uh, job creation for all of you and me. So, ciao. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Bye-bye. Thank bye. you. Bye-bye. Ciao. Ciao.